Who here has been in a locker room before a big game? Raise your hand up. Oh, a lot of you have not had this experience. You want to know what it's like to be in the locker room before a big game? Watch this video. Great moments are born from great opportunity. You shouldn't have any doubt in your mind about what you're supposed to do tonight and about how you're supposed to do it. This is your time. Now, I don't want them to gain another yard. We gotta go out there and we gotta take it. You take their game and you shove it right back in their face. That's how winning is done. Team is something you belong to, something you feel. Don't come together. It's over. And I guarantee a week won't go by in your life. You won't regret walking out, letting them get the best of you. I'll ask you one last time. To be the best that you can be. Play like champions. Win. Come on, people. From Rocky to the Mighty Ducks. If that stuff doesn't get you fired up, then you don't understand what getting fired up is. I'm telling you right now, it's the beginning of the NFL season, and I'm fired up. For the Seahawks. Hey, 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 I'm a man of prayer. I'm praying for the 49ers. I'm praying, I'm praying for y'all. I don't know if prayer will work in this game. I'm, I'm fasting for the Raiders. I'm fasting for them. Hey, what is our context? Right there on your sermon notes, I want you to write this in right here. This is Paul's locker room speech. Paul's getting to the end of the book of Colossians, and he's actually getting to the very end of his life, and he gathers the guys together. One of them's named Ty, another name's Ari, then he's got Mark in there, and he's like, come on, boys, I'm in chains here. We're in a cell here. We've got the Roman authorities compressing and repressing us at every turn, but we're going to go out there. We're going to preach the mystery of Christ, and we're going to take this world for Jesus, and they just, ah, they're going nuts. What is it that Paul says in the final part of this book that actually caused this ragtag team, this Cinderella story to achieve something in three generations? They took down the Roman Empire. Lord Jesus, right now, I just pray. Because <laughs> this is so much better when this TV works. How's it going? It's Ben McCourt, Andrew's son, everyone. He's super smart. All right, let's go ahead and read the passage. You guys got it right here. You're going to have to actually take your sermon notes out. I know some of you are like, I'm a man and I never take notes. But you're going to have to take this out. Come on, put it in your hands. And we're going to have to read it because... And it'll go up on those screens too. We got a plethora of screens here at Base All right, let's go ahead and look at this last little bit here. And we're going to figure out exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying in this Paul's locker room speech passage at the end of our series. Uh, starting in verse 2. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Do you feel the locker room exhortation in here? One after another, he's exhorting, 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 and then it shifts. And I want you to take some notes here. You got a pen? Every name I want you to write next to that name either the word Gentile or Jewish. Gentile or Jewish. And we're going to see what makes the team that Paul has given this speech up to. Verse 7, Tychicus, what do you think, Jew or Gentile? Gentile, very good. You got it right. I'm going to guess because two of you mumbled. Will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onimus. Jew or Gentile? 
Gentile as well. Very good. Our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. In other words, he's from Colossia. They will tell you everything that has happened to me. So he's got two faithful messengers here. They're going to give a report exactly what's happening in terms of Paul's arrest and imprisonment and the end of Paul's ministry here. Verse 10, my fellow prisoner, this is a hard one, ready? Aristarchus, 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 Aristarchus. Say it three times your neighbor and you're a Pentecostal. <laughs> Joke works every time. Aristarchus sends you his greetings as does Mark. Okay, Aristarchus and Mark, which, which one, Gentile or Jewish? Jewish, very good. Oh, you guys are killing 815. Write Jewish next to both those names. The cousin of Barnabas, also a Jewish person. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, he's Jewish, and he's got a nickname because his real name is Jesus, and that's super confusing. <laughs> So they call him Justice, he's Jewish, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my coworkers for the kingdom of God, and they have proven a comfort to me. Uh, Epaphras, Gentile. Gentile, very good. Uh, he's kind of a clue that he says these are the only Jews. <laughs> I see you up there paying attention, good job. Epaphras, Gentile, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is also wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and those at Laodicea and Hyperolus. Our dear friend Luke. Nope. That's, mark yourself down. Red mark, one wrong. That's a Gentile. Luke is a Gentile. The doctor and Demas. Gentile, send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters of Laodicea and to Nympha. This is a female leader who, look at the last phrase, and the church in her house who actually leads a church in her house. Verse 16, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read to the church of Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. So often when you're reading the New Testament, it'll say to the Ephesians, to the Romans, that's the starting place. They were circular letters. Everyone read everyone else's letters, right? Verse 17, tell Archippus, See to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. This is a pastor. We know nothing about him, but Paul's exhorting him to be a good pastor. And then verse 18, he finishes with this. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my change. Grace be with you all. Paul often recited his letters. Sometimes if you get the Bible on audio and you listen to Paul's letters, they actually make more sense. Because you've got to imagine when these things are being written, he's actually pacing around and someone is taking notes. In this particular instance, at the end of the letter, and he does this several times. He writes in his own hand as a way of saying, this really is me writing this letter to you. Now, why is this locker speech so important to us now 2,000 years later? The first little paragraph that's all exhortation, we know why that's important. It's full of instruction. But then that second half where he's just naming names and dropping names and doing greetings and writing personal notes, does any of that matter to you and I? Can we skip all of the say hello to so-and-so and tell so-and-so I said hi, or is all of it a part of how Paul actually finished so well? Here's the thing that I want you to understand. When you ask the question, why master this material? This is Paul proving that what he has said in chapter one and two and three actually really works. Your relational health comes directly from your doctrinal health. In other words, what you believe about the truth is actually what strengthens you in terms of your relationships. Your life is as good as your relationships and your relationships is as good as the doctrine, the truth, the theology, the belief, the core set of values in your heart of hearts. Here's how I put this. This is a really clever way of putting it. Here it is. Your creed determines the strength of your crew. Your creed, what you believe, determines the health. You want to have a better marriage, you got to start with the right fundamental beliefs. You want to have a better relationship with your kids or your parents or your coworkers or your teachers or your employees or your employee. It all starts with what you believe inside of you. So when the Apostle Paul demonstrates relationship at the end, that's not inconsequential. It's not just a little note he's writing to some people. It's the proof that what he wrote in chapters 1, 2, and 3 is so important. Paul lives out his theology and so should you you and I. Here's the thing. It's not good enough just to have the inspiring speech. 
You got to believe it in such a way that changes your life. I, I, I uh, played football as a kid. Did anyone here play football as a kid? I played middle school, high school. Didn't play college. I wish I could have, but I picked my parents poorly. And... Um, <laughs> And I wasn't coordinated for that. I mean, I loved it. I played every, you know, they say it causes drain damage, but I played every year. <laughs> and I remember one time in middle school, man, I, we went out to play this team in Tenasket and I thought we're going to lose because we were flat in the warmups. And we went out there, man. And I'm telling you what, I was in the locker room before the game and we're at the top of this hill that the stands were built on. And in our hometown stadium, the stands were also built on a hill. And the varsity guys used to come out of the locker room and run down this hill. And it was just awesome. It was just like, like a thundering herd of muscular men football. Rah, yeah. It was like that. And so I thought, in, for this junior high team, I'm going to give them this speech. And we're going to come running down the hill at this, at this guest stadium and we're going to have the same effect. So I gather all the guys together and I'm like, we got to go out there today. Our whole day, blah, blah, blah. this is how winning is done. And I give them the whole thing and they start getting fun. And I said, we're going to run down that hill. We're going to intimidate them so much and we're going to win this game. And this little kid named Donnie, he, he still had his baby fat. He was like that tall and that wide. And he believed me. He was like, let's do it. And he just ran out of the locker room. And so we just all followed him and we just ran as fast as we went down that hill at 500 miles an hour. We're just running. We're like, ah! And he gets down to the very bottom of the hill. Everyone's watching. And then he stops. Just stops. Like supernaturally comes to a stop and levitates. And I was like, what's happening? And in that millisecond of slow motion, I realized that at the bottom of their hill, they had put a little wire that we didn't have at the bottom of our hill. And he had literally run into that wire. It stopped him cold. It lifted him up. It stretched that wire out. And he became a human slingshot cannonball <laughs> and shot back into 20 other middle school kids. And you had 50 elbows and knees of middle school in that huge, giant pile. The leather team was laughing. The crowd was, we lost by three touchdowns, people. <laughs> Sometimes the locker room speech isn't enough. You actually have to put the practice in and put the team together that can win the game. If you're still with me, give me an amen. amen. Here's the essential relationships of an effective team. You need three of them. And the first two are really obvious. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. And then we're going to dive in name by name into who should really be on your team. Number one is this. You need God on your team. Duh. You need God on your team. And you need to, here's the specific way to have God on your team. You need to seek him prayerfully. What does that mean? That's, it means that you have to be the sort of person that employs the privilege of a relationship with God to actually move your team and your life forward. Here's the key question. Where does prayer fit into your life, your life strategy? Oftentimes, we only pray when there's crisis. And by the way, how many agree that when there's a crisis, it's a good thing we have access to God? There's nothing wrong of praying during crisis, but if you only pray during crisis, you're missing most of the benefit of prayer. Prayer is not just for crisis, it's for opportunity and open doors. Here's the three things that God wants to give you in prayer according to this passage. Number one is an alert focus. An alert focus. Here's the thing, I believe this, the more you pay attention, the more you pay attention. The more you actually get with God and let him focus your mind on what you should be alert about, the more you're going to start seeing where God is working and get in line with God. When you get on your knees and start focusing on God, you start seeing everyone and your circumstances better, clearer, and in a more alert way. The second one is this, it's you get more gratitude in your life, a thankful disposition. You have this idea that when you go into prayer, I don't know if this ever happens to you. I go into prayer and I start complaining to God all the time. This is not working out at work. This is not working out in my family. This is not working out in my life. And as I complain to God, God starts going, but this is good and that's good. And I gave you this and I did this and I answered that before. What are you whining about? And my heart starts to change. And I'm like, you know what? It's not as bad as I thought. And the third one is this, a supernatural opportunity. You know, Paul's one of the best leaders that was ever around. And yet even Paul said, I'm not going to go through a door that God doesn't open. A lot of times we're relying on our own opportunity creation instead of going, God, where are you opening a door? And I'm going to go through the door that you open. And would you please open this door that I can never open on my own? 
I have a good friend named Ken. Ken is an amazing businessman. He lives in the Bay Area. He started five or six different businesses. He's a multimillionaire. He's got a great foundation called the Living Stones Foundation that actually just puts fuel on the fire of really great ministries. Ken's whole goal is to be a great witness to his employees, to be a great witness to the business world, and to pour out resources for the kingdom of God. And God has blessed Ken. He's just blessed him and blessed him and blessed him. And I, I had a meeting with him once at the end of the meeting. I said, can I just ask you one question? He said, what is it? I said, give me your one big business strategy. What's the strategy thing you do? And I thought he was going to talk about getting the best team around you. And I thought he was going to talk about risk analysis, but he looked right at me and said, that's easy, Kurt. The thing that has blessed my businesses the most, the thing that's given me the best ideas, the thing that's actually caused us to go far beyond what I expected or imagined is simply this, prayer. My two biggest ideas, Kurt, he said, I got when I was sitting quietly listening to the Lord. One of them, I'm driving in traffic and God just said, you know what? You ought to put the software people together with the inventory people and see if you can come up with a program that'll actually cause the software to change the inventory every single time someone buys someone. It's called, uh, uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, point of sale inventory. He's one of the inventors of that. He got that idea in prayer. Listen to me, my friend. God wants to give you multi-million dollar ideas. Whoa, Kurt, you're preaching that word faith stuff. Oh, you're preaching that name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. I don't believe in any of that stuff. I don't believe in positive confession. I don't believe your words have power to create riches. Here's what I believe, that when you bow your knee and bow your heart before the sovereign God of the universe and say, God, if you give me an idea, I won't use it for myself or my own wealth. I will use it to help hurting people. God's looking for that person. And that's what Ken said. God's looking for that person. Are you saying to me, Kurt, that if I get on my knees and I purpose that every opportunity God gives me, I'll leverage it for the kingdom and to help hurting people, God will give me grace. Yes, that's what I'm saying. God's ideas are better than your ideas. Are you asking him for some ideas? Turn to your neighbor and say, yeah, he's still got it. He's still got it. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and say, he needs to work on his humility though. He does. <laughs> Okay, first thing you need on your team is you need God and you need him prayerfully. Second thing is you need society on your team and you need to speak with grace. This is counterintuitive to think that we actually need our culture on our team. But the truth of the matter is we are in a us against them culture right now and it's destroying all of us. And if anyone's going to lead this, it has to be Christians. The same problem as when Paul was there. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be full of grace. You know, you know what this is like? This is like a fourth grader. How many have ever had a fourth grader in your life before? You know what a fourth grader looks like? Third grader, fifth. Here's the thing about fourth graders. I got a couple of them sit right there. So they're horrible at remembering their homework. Their, their whole backpack, they will leave it everywhere. They don't brush their teeth. They can't make their bed. Their, their memories are, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. How many know what I'm talking about? You forgot? It's a giant backpack. I forgot, I forgot. Tie number two. This part, I'll give it up for the guy that turns the TV off. I'm going to have him put the Seahawks game on if we go over. Okay. A fourth grader will forget every single time unless you promise them ice cream. Do you ever remember that? And then you don't deliver. You're like, you're like um, Dad, on Wednesday at 4.35 p.m., uh, you said, and I'm pulling up the record now, we should all go to ice cream someday. And yet it's been three days since you've said that. Are you a Christian or not? We're wanting to know. A fourth grader remembers when you promise. You know what our whole world is like? They're like a fourth grader. Every single promise we make as Christians and as the church that we don't fulfill, they remember it. They remember it. They won't remember anything else. My friends, we've got to get to a place where we're talking full of grace and seasoned with salt. Here's what he says. Here's the key question. Um, is this the right message, the right time, and the right place? I'll tell you what the right message, the right time, and the right place is, is city serve. Enough talk, more getting our hands dirty. Amen? Here's another question you can ask. How do people feel after I give them instruction? Do people feel uplifted after I give them instruction, or do they feel degraded? A lot of times the instruction you give them is the right instruction, but you don't give it in a way that they can hear it. You ever have that friend who could rebuke you and you feel better later? 
It's like, man, that was an awesome meeting where he told me over and over again what I was doing wrong. But they just do it in a way that's for you and builds you up. We've got to learn that skill to build the right team around us. He's got two phrases in here. Um, let's, let's break them down. Always be full of grace and always seasoned with salt. Always full of grace and always seasoned with salt. What does he mean? Full of grace just simply means this. It's real technical. It means be nicer. Be kinder. Say something kind. Nice wins. We live in a world where actually bullying, the more we've talked about don't bully, the more bullies we've gotten. We live in a world where bullying is a strategy. I want to tell you that's a failed strategy. And when it crumbles, it's going to crumble big time. And it's going to crumble on the people that use it the most. My friend, say something sweet. And then maybe you can say something that's a little bit sour. Then the second thing he says is season it with salt. We have a phrase in our culture, we say, we say that's salty language, right? Salty language. This is not God saying you can cuss. This is not what this passage is saying. But we've got to think in our Near East first century mind. What was salt used for in Paul's day? Preservation. Pres pres preservation. It was used to keep meats long term. So, and it was very valuable. You didn't put it on eggs. You never would put salt on eggs because it was too expensive. It would, be, it would be like putting gold dust on eggs, which by the way, there is a restaurant here in Granite Bay that does that. It's really nice with some salmon roe. Okay, that was funny. I don't care if you don't laugh. Because the foofy restaurants in our area, do you get, Johnny, you got it. Okay, thank you. Um, what does it mean? I got to keep going. What does it mean to season our words with salt? It says, say something that lasts. Say something that ages well. Say something that actually five years from now, you won't be embarrassed. Five years from now, are you going to be proud of everything you said to your kids? Are you going to be proud of everything you said to your teacher or your employee? Can you say so? Can you think through your words and go, will this tweet age well? Will this Facebook post age well? That's what it means to say something with a little bit of seasoning in it. Number three, write this in, the church. And this is all about selecting a team. We're going to honor Bryce. And I want to tell you, one of the things that Bryce has said that's just powerfully, powerfully been a reminder of my life is simply this. Every single person, he says, has a dream and every single person has a team. You have a dream from God. You may have forgotten your dream. You may have never known your dream. You may have had your dream and gotten distracted. But I want to tell you, if God made you and he did, if God knit you in your mother's womb and he did, then he's given you a dream to fulfill. And here's the kicker. You can't can't be who God said you are unless you actually know the dream and then build a team. You got to know the dream and build a team. And when you're in the center of your dream and surrounded by your team, I'm telling you, my best experiences, and this will be true for you too, have always been team experiences. We're not meant to be the lone wolf. We're not meant to be the lone ranger. We do best when we get the behind the back blind pass, when we catch the ball in the end zone, when we make the block that delivers the run. I'm using all sports analogies, but I don't care. If you're not sporty, sit down on the couch and watch an NFL game because I'm going to preach sporty this weekend. Okay. You made the cast. You're in the choir. We can do all that too. It's all the same. You're on a committee at works. People make fun of committees, but every once in a while you get on a committee and that committee is a great committee. Our best experiences are team experiences. And if you don't know your dream and you're not on a team, then you're not living the best life you could live. Listen to me. Jesus Christ came to earth. He spent one night in prayer doing what? Picking his team. If Jesus spent a whole night saying, God, who are the real apostles? Not just the disciples. Who are the 12 that I'm going to work with? If Jesus spent a whole night being deliberate and selecting a team, how much more do you and I prayerfully need to go, God, who is it that should be on a team with me? He said, there's a problem with Bayside, and this is a wonderful problem to have, but you walk in here and there's so many people, you can be anonymous. My friend, you've got to microserve. You gotta say, who are the four or five in my small group, in my serve project? This is so powerfully here. Now, a lot of times we'd be tempted to skip this part of the passage, but this is the real meat of the power of the Apostle Paul. Three quick observations. I want you to write it in this white space right here because they, they were gonna give me some white space here and I was like, no, they'll have to micro write. So we'll just turn right here and you write this stuff right in here. You have to write complete sentences, ha, ha, ha. 
Paul's team, three observations, they had passion over position. In other words, they weren't worried about promotions. They weren't worried about who had the corner office. They weren't worried who had the right title. My friends, you don't need a title. You need tenacity. Passion wins over position every time. Sometimes in our classroom, in our work, we're looking for more and better position. But I want to tell you what, they didn't have position. They didn't care about position. Paul's office was in a jail cell. They cared about passion. Where does your heart beat? Follow God. And you're going to find that every position you need is given to you. They had unity, the second bullet, over uniformity. In other words, they were so stinking diverse, and yet they were combined together in a unified fashion in terms of their duty. They had diversity. They weren't uniformity. There was, by the way, if you're sitting next to someone who doesn't have your skin color, your hair texture, your background, your socioeconomic level, your age, then you're doing it right. When we actually come together in unity and diversity, that's when we become incredibly powerful. That's when the diversity of gifts and the diversity of backgrounds pointed at the same problem results in strength. They were diverse in strength, but unified in service. And that's why a ragtag group of both Jew and Gentile, think about this, Jew, Gentile. If you were, I don't know if you're like this, but I'm, my sports team, I'm always second guessing them. They, they draft this guy, they sign that person. And I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm a pastor from Granite Bay. I know more than you. Does anyone else do that? On your fantasy football, what are you doing? What are you doing? If I was in the first century and I was reading this letter and I saw the three Jews that were listed and the three Gentiles that were listed and the woman that was listed here, I'd go, this is the worst team ever. This team's not going to come. How can you get Jews and Gentiles, male and female, to work together in the first? It had never happened. And I would have been wrong. Paul puts together the most diverse team ever put together and they changed the Roman Empire. My friend, we need to become more diverse and more unified, amen? I'm, I'm telling you, I told myself I'd be just calm, but I get fired up on that point. <laughs> and then here's the last one. This is the kicker, fellowship over fame. Fellowship over fame. What does that mean? It means that they valued the quality of relationship far more than their own ambitions. And here's the promise that God makes. When you put fellowship over fame, you ultimately get both. When you put fellowship as the top priority, loving others, then what happens is your life becomes significant and meaningful. All right, one last section. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's almost done. What was the makeup of Paul's jail house crew? Okay, so a lot of times you can be really cute the way you teach this and go, you need to have this sort of person in your life or you need to be this sort of person. We're not gonna do that because first of all, I'm not gonna tell you have every single one of these people in your life because then that would mean you're the apostle Paul and you're not. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're Peter at best. You're Peter at best. <laughs> Some of you are Lydia, you know, you pick the gender. But the point is, it's not, it's not a formula where you go, you have to have every single one of these people or you have to be one of these people. It's a general idea of the power of team that Paul actually believed in. Does this make sense? So let's just, we're just gonna pull out some general thoughts out of here and I'm gonna let you apply it to your life on which one of these people really God wants to speak to you about. Are you with me? Okay, here they are. There's, there's a bunch of them, so we're gonna go fast. There's uh, Tychicus. Tychicus is the way Paul uh, Ray says it. Uh, Tychicus is the way Andrew says it. Um, you decide which one you're more loyal to. But here's the thing. I'm just gonna call him Ty. He's a dependable messenger. Dependable messenger. What does that mean? He's literally carrying the book of Philemon. He's carrying the book of Colossians and he's carrying the book of Ephesians. He's the guy that Paul says, when you want to make sure it gets done right, you lean on this guy. I could never be this person on the team because I have no sense of direction. Like my GPS continually just says recalculating. It's just, I have no, I don't know where North is right now. This guy knew how to get the job done. And then you have Onimus and Onimus was the delivered refugee. He's a slave. He's the messy team member. Onimus, you should never have him on your team because he's got political problems and he's got background baggage and he's got a relationship problems, but Paul puts him on the team. Why? Because Paul understands this. If you have all safe people on your team, you don't have a God team. God doesn't like all safe people on his team. But Paul understands this, that the mess is worth the ministry sometimes. And Paul understands this, messy people produce mighty miracles. 
So Paul puts the messy person on his team. And then the third one is Eratarchus. Eratarchus. He's the devoted companion. Scholars tell us that he had no need to be in jail with Paul. He was not accused of anything. He was just there to be loyal. And then you have Mark, the do-over disciples. So Mark is mentioned in the book of Acts. He goes on a missionary journey with Paul and his uncle Barnabas, and they're on this journey, and Mark starts complaining. The beds aren't great, and there's gluten in the diet. And he's like, he's, he's, he's all like, you know, I... Can you take a selfie for me or with me? Or, and, and, and at one point, Paul goes, listen, you're going to be on a journey with me. We're going to get into some rough spots. You have to preach the gospel and have some courage. He's like, I don't like the mobs. You know, and then they're having this fight. And so Paul's like, then you should quit the team. He's like, I will quit. And then Barnabas goes, come on, let's all hug. And he's like, no, you're just, you're too soft with him. Sound like your marriage. <laughs> and Barnabas gets mad and Barnabas and Mark leave and they have a split. What happens? We don't know. 14 years later is when Colossians is being written, about 14 years later. And all we know is this, they forgave each other. That's all we know. They got back together. They restored the relationship. Mark came back and took a second shot. Now, I want to say something about do-over disciples. Because if the only thing Bayside did is love on do-over disciples, we would quadruple the size of Bayside. There's so many people that they get a little bit distracted. They make a wrong turn. And then they find themselves outside the church. And you know what they think? They think, all oh, those people that go to Bayside don't love me anymore. They actually think that if they showed up for a weekend after being gone for a year, a year and a half, or two years that we would notice them and go, oh my gosh, there you are. You've been gone for 18 months, three weeks, and four hours. Thank goodness. You were, we're right. You were wrong. We're right. You were wrong. Your back sit right there. <laughs> they think that that's what we would act. The truth is most of us haven't even been sensitive enough to realize that they went missing. That's right. They show up and we'd be like, you've been going to A15? I mean, I haven't seen you. <laughs> Here's my exhortation to you. Would you find a do-over disciple and let them know we love them? Would you find a do-over disciple and let them know we haven't given up on them? This is the important one. Would you find a do-over disciple and let them know that they're not more sinful than us, that everyone has a doubt, everyone goes on a distraction, everyone has a moment where they trip and a season where they need some help. And if you're a do-over disciple in this room and you're recently coming back, I want to tell you I'm proud of you. I love you. I don't think I'm better than you. And you need to play a part. Amen. Just like Mark. You are doing so much better than 815. I want to tell you, that was really good. Um, and then we have Mark, I mean, we have Luke, the doctor and scholar. You know what this means? Paul was smart enough to have people smarter than him in his team. And here's the thing. Paul is an academic. Paul's a super smart guy. And yet, he's smart enough to know that I don't have it all figured out. And so he gets, who's smarter than you in your team? If you hang around people smarter than you, you'll become smarter. And then Epaphras, he's the devout intercessory. He's the guy that has said he's praying faithfully for the Colossia. Now, listen, I, I tell you what, you guys are so encouraging to me. You really are. I mean, just more than I deserve. I go out in public, I meet you out in the courtyard, and you're like, Pastor Kerr, we love you. We love your sermons. We love Andrew. We love Ray. We love the worship. We love Bayside. You're so encouraging. But I want to tell you the thing that encourages me the most. And I can usually tell when people are serious and sincere or when they're just saying it. Sometimes someone will look me in the eye and they say, Pastor Kurt, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And I'm praying for your family, and I'm praying for Bayside. And I want to tell you, more than any compliment about anything we do around here, when you say you're actually on your knees for me, my family, and this church, I'm telling you, there's something inside of me that grows and becomes stronger. Everyone needs someone praying for them, amen? amen. Everyone needs someone that goes, I got problems, but they're not as big as Kurt Harlow's problems, <laughs> so I'm going to pray for him. It just feels so right and good when you got that team member on your team that's praying for you. By the way, some of you, you're so called to be that person. And then the last two, you have Justice, who's the deferential servant. What do I mean by that? You know what we know about Justice? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. We can't find any other documents that mention him. We don't know if he's, you know, eating gluten or not. We don't know, you know, if he wants a full-size bed or a queen in his hotel room. We don't know. Not, we know nothing. Except for one thing. This is all we know about justice. And it's the only thing you need to know. He was on the team. He was there. He showed up. Sometimes, my friend, it's not your gifting. It's not your words. It's showing up. 
Sometimes the only thing you need to unleash change in someone else's life is to give the present of presents. To lock arms. You don't need a title or a name. You don't need an Enneagram that's five paragraphs long. I'm an eight, wing four, subcategory three. I just offended all the eights, wing fours. I'm sorry. You know what you need? You need to show up. When I walk into City Serve, Serve Site, and you're there, I can't tell you how powerful that is. But even more so when a principal or a student or a teacher shows up and there's 500 Bayside'ers scrubbing the gum off their campus, painting the wall that no one wanted to paint and ripping out the weeds of neglect. There's something powerful about just showing up. And the final one is this, Demas. Demas is mentioned one other place in the Bible and Paul says about him in that place, he loved the world and he left us. It's Demas the deserter. Everyone has someone that betrays them. Jesus had Judas, Paul had Demas. And and here's just a question. It's justice or Demas. It's justice versus Demas. Which one are we going to be? Go ahead, go to that next slide, guys. Are you with me? Now all the projectors are broken. (laughs) There it is. It's justice versus Demas. Are we gonna be the no name defense that shows up? Or are we gonna be Demas? So my last football game, I remember it really, really well. I was, uh, I was in the playoffs. I was a lineman and it was bitter cold. Just everyone wait, we're way ahead of time. I was a lineman, I was bitter cold and I was like going, man, I don't think I can finish this game. I was so tired, so beat up. And we had one last play. If we made the first down on that play, we win the whole game. If we don't make the first down, it's gonna go into double overtime. And I just gotta block this guy like twice. I gotta block him like twice and we'll probably win the game. But this guy's huge, like proof of evolution. They hike the ball and he just smacks into me so hard. And I know if I can hit him one more time, I'll protect my quarterback, but he goes way around the side of me And I think to myself, I don't need to hit him again. He's too far away. He'll never sack the quarterback in time. And he didn't. He was too far away. He couldn't sack the quarterback. All he could do is get one hand on the quarterback's arm as he threw. And so instead of throwing a perfect pass for the first down, my quarterback threw the ball straight up in the air. Their linebacker caught it, ran 60 yards, scored a touchdown, and we lost the game. I only have one reoccurring dream in my life. And that dream is I'm 55 years old playing high school football and I crush that guy. Because here's the thing, you can live with a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. If I would have blocked him as hard as I could block him and he still would have got to my quarterback, I could have lived with that. I could have lived with giving my best effort and having it not been enough. But you can't live with a regret. Lincoln, come on out here. A regret is a cancer of the mind. A regret is when you say, I didn't give it my all and I should have, I should have. I wanna tell you, on our city serve day, I'll wake up the next morning and I will not have a regret. And that's what I'm praying for you as well. Hey, I wanna ask that nobody uh, move around just for a couple more minutes here. This is actually very important. Uh, And uh, just before I talk about this, can we say thanks to Kurt? What a great message. Thank you, Kurt. Good stuff. Thanks, Thanks, buddy. Love you. How many think, uh, how many think Kurt ought to consider, you know, like doing this? <laughs> Just pray about it. Pray about it. Uh, I want you to take out this card and uh, some of you might be asking the question. I hope you're asking this question after hearing that. How can I be a great team player? How can I be that person who maybe grabs the arm of the quarterback and changes the game? As we look at going to uh, Golden One and doing city serve, the reality is this, the only way this works at the end of the day is if everybody says, I'm a team player, I wanna do my part. So step one in doing that is to serve. Step one is serve. And so I want you all to do this and I'll never ask you to do this again in church. Take your phones out. Everybody get your phones out. And I want you to go to your text thread 
And I just want you to text the word serve to 56316. Text the word serve to 56316. Or if you want a Granite Bay specific serve site, GB serve. Yep, you GB can do that serve. too. You can do GB serve if you want to be uh, just Granite Bay project. But one of those two, either serve or GB serve to 56316. As soon as you send that, you're going to get a link back and you can sign up for a, an area to serve. Don't do the sign up for the serve area just yet. There's one other thing I want you to do. The other part of this is that doing something like this costs a lot of money. We are going to set up, for instance, a massive mobile medical clinic. I don't know if you know this, but last year when we did this, more people got turned away than got treated at the mobile medical clinic. So we're going to try to make it even larger this year. If you're, if you're wondering what about our, our mobile clinic that the Motion Campaign paid for, aren't we using that? Uh, the, the hope is that that will be finished in time, but this extra stuff will be in addition to, in addition to that. There are, in our region, hundreds of thousands of people who are a million miles away from God who will never darken the doors of a church. And what this is about is bringing the church to those people. Bringing the church to those people, going and being the church. But it takes all of us to be a part of that. So as you heard earlier, we actually challenged our staff. Well, everybody, well, we did this in staff meeting, took our phones out. We texted the word give, and I want you to do this right now. And this isn't, this isn't you committing to give. You just, I want to take you to the link. Text the word give to 56316. <laughs> Now here's the cool part. If they always no, pick a picture where I looked so if, angry. If for no other yeah. reason, if for no other reason, there's a video of Kurt, you get to actually see this video if you want to see that uh, right underneath that link. But text the word give to 56316. When you hit send, you're going to get a link. This is a highly secure one-time setup. Once you set it up once, it makes it very easy. When you want to give, you just boom, 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 grab the number. You scroll down. There's a spot you can scroll to. Uh, and you choose uh, City Serve. <laughs> these pictures. <these, laughs> it's so good. <laughs> mm. yeah. It's like I was saying, children, come on in and gather yeah. around. I'm all. I like Pastor Kurt's going to teach you how to give online. <laughs> I like to think he's more refined. Mm, right? mm. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then you'll scroll down to uh, city serve and you can choose to give there and as you can see there's some uh, number suggestions for you but we want everybody to take part in this everyone can do something we had thrive students given five dollars uh, uh, just full disclosure here my wife and i have not done this yet uh, but she is here and and uh we're going to give away more than $100. We don't, I don't know what the number is because Jesus, i.e. my wife, has not indicated to me what that is yet. My, my wife is here, and I want to tell her I gave it a 15, so just FYI. Yes. Wherever you're sitting, babe. I, got, I was really generous at a 15. Okay, so you can do that through online. There's also this card. If you're like, I'm not tech savvy and I'm not going there, you can take this card, you can fill this out put it in the yellow envelope and drop that in the bucket as you leave. So everyone look right up here, very important. We don't do arm twisting about things like this very often. And if you feel like I'm twisting your arm now, I am. Um, at 8.15, 35 people did this. We are hoping that a thousand people do it at this service thousand people. If everyone who comes to our churches across all campuses did this, it would more than pay for the event. Yes. So we're just, just any part that you can do. It could be a dollar. It could be a thousand dollars. It could be $10,000. Whatever you can do to help make this happen would go a long ways. And we believe that this city serve event will be the single biggest, most impactful thing that a church has done for a community, maybe in the history of our country, that we are getting out there, we are making a difference, we're closing down church, and then we're going to culminate at Golden One to make it happen. And just by a show of hands, real quick, how many have ever gone to a Kings game? And just hold your hands up, just keep them up. Most of you have gone to a Kings game. How many have gone to a concert at Golden One? Has anybody here ever paid more than $100 to go there and get some? So, so listen to this, we're going to go... 
And we're going to do a full, Brian King Joseph is coming up to be a part of this. It's going to be, we're going to blow it up. It's going to be a blast drive. Worship's going to be there. I'll be there and Zorro and all the gang. And we're going to have a blast. But again, it's very expensive to do this. So please just pray about it and say, I want to be a part of the team. And we're not even wondering if you're going to say yes or no. It's just, what are you going to do? And so, uh, Kurt, if you would take a second and pray for this. Amen. uh, One last little thing. Next week. We are going to take time in every single service and in every single building here to lay hands on and pray for students for their school year. We've gone like four or five weeks in school. Everyone knows what the challenges are, amen? So if you have a student, know a student, can define what a student means according to Webster, we want you to bring your students to church next week, amen? Is everyone with me on that? And we're going to pray for them every service. Let's pray over this. God, thank you so much that an army is going to serve, that an army is going to support, and that an army is going to show up. Yeah. God, let us link arms together and make a difference in the lives of hurting people and for your glory. And everyone said? Yeah.